going to take care of yourself first. Okay, hello. Thank you all for coming out uh, this evening. Apologize, a few minutes late, but um, we really appreciate all of you uh, taking the time on your
oftentimes controversial water, land, environment issues that we deal with every day at the legislature. And so that was a learning experience for me this past session. I had to deal with big issues. The water bill dominated the legislature this session, and I was right in the heart of that. Um, but I learned a lot from it. Also served as a committee on Hawaiian Affairs. That was important to me this past session, is I wanted to be on Hawaiian Affairs as a native Hawaiian. I thought it was really important that the Committee on Hawaiian Affairs have Hawaiians on. And so I encouraged my colleagues, Senator Kyoho Kalole, Kipaneohe, myself, uh, and others to serve on that committee, and I was able to serve as the Vice Chair. That became critically important because I had a big role in the Department of Hawaiian Homelands this past year, as well as the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. Uh, and then I came back as a, committee on, on a member on the Committee on Ways and Means. That's important because that's where the money comes from in terms of the operational budget. We'll talk about that tonight. Uh, and how we manage and effectively and hopefully efficiently spend your and my hard-earned taxpayer dollars. And then it was important to me to stay on higher education even though I was the chair or the vice chair. But to come back on higher education because there are things that are very important to me, like the University of Hilo and its aviation program that uh, I promised my dad I would help bring to fruition. And we were able to move that a little bit closer to uh, fruition uh, this past session. So that's your Senator from Hilo. Hi. Uh, so I haven't met any of you before. Uh, I'm Chris Todd. And uh, Senator Takai, I was actually appointed it is technically the very beginning of 2017 after Rapsuji passed away. Um, so I think he's got seniority on me by like nine months, nine months. something like that. <laughs> um, we came here around the same time. Uh, so when I initially came on board, I was the last member to get seated. It was right before the beginning of the 2017 session. And I served on the uh, Consu Consumer uh, Protection Committee originally, as well as uh, Health and Human Services. Uh, but you know, kind of echoing what Kai uh, mentioned, you know, I had an opportunity going into my second year, which was um, not this past spring, but the spring before, kind of actually ask on to certain committees. So I asked on to the Water and Land Committee, um, and then um, on to the Committee on Finance, which deals with pretty much any money that flows or any fiscal bills, so any appropriations, um, but beyond that, things like tax code issues, um, audits, that sort of thing. Um, and then, uh, basically what happened this past year is that I asked to be on the same committees and I was the vice chair for uh, the Committee on Waterland and Hawaiian Affairs because the Hawaiian Affairs Committee was originally part of the Committee on Ocean and Marine Resources which was separate from Water and Land. Water and Land basically dealt with uh, water that's on the land and in the land. So things like streams, uh, you know, larger rivers, lakes, that sort of thing. Not that we have a ton of those. Um, but the Hawaiian Affairs portion was pushed into the Water and Land Committee. So now it's broader and includes ocean marine resources, so things like fishing issues, um, or transportation on water, in addition to Hawaiian Affairs, and a lot of the same subject matter that you know, Kai mentioned. You know, the kind of the, the water bill, which dealt with a lot of uh, water diversion and permitting and that sort of thing. Um, and then beyond that, you know, I'm a member of the um, Committee on Energy and Environmental Protection. Uh, so a lot of clean energy issues and a lot of the uh, climate change mitigation issues that we uh, didn't end up really dealing with this past time. Um, but then beyond that, you know, I think it was important for me to be on these committees this year because a lot of very critical issues were pushing uh, forward. But also, you know, Kai mentioned the importance of having Native Hawaiians on the Committee on Hawaiian Affairs. And I think one of the reasons he mentions that is that you know, very, it's very, very probably the House has no Hawaiians on the Hawaiian Affairs Committee. Uh, there are a variety of reasons for it. A lot of it's just that we, I think we only have five out of 51, which is also pretty staggering. Um, but having to represent uh, Kelpa and Paneva as part of Chilo, I thought it was important that those homesteads at least have a voice, even if I couldn't be a native Hawaiian voice on that committee. Um, so I did think that that was important, and you know, I think the biggest, uh, the biggest thing going into you know, completing my third session and now coming into the interim is that uh, you know, really going through your first couple 
a lot of it's you're not sure on the processes and you're kind of getting a feel for the people you're working with. But going to the third year is definitely a lot more comfortable. You really have a, a better handle on issues because they've come before you multiple times. Uh, so this time around, I definitely felt a lot more comfortable in dealing with a lot of these things and in particular dealing with a lot of the people um, that we have to work with on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, before we move on, I wanted to make sure that we uh, said a special mahalo to the University of Guadalajara, who every single year that we ask to come here um, graciously gives us the opportunity to come. Uh, Chancellor Marsha Sakai, who can't be here, um, helped coordinate this, as well as uh, Vice Chancellor of Administrative Affairs, Kelly Raposo, in the back. Our IT specialist, Blaine Bautista. And so thank you guys. Can we give them a uh, mahalo? <laughs> have in the audience tonight, and that would be Councilwoman Sue Leloy. Thank you so much for coming. And I think that's everyone I see now. Okay, so uh, how we plan to do this is we have about, I don't know, 15 or so slides. Um, we'll talk about the budget because this is a big year. Uh, PowerPoint probably takes, hopefully, no longer than half an hour or so. It takes us to about 6.15, 6.30 max. And then we'll open it up to questions and fire away. Um, we can talk about anything you want to talk about. So, let's, current legislature, spaceport, Buffalo, TNT, it's all fair game. Buhanoa, we're here for you. We are not afraid to address your concerns. At least to the best of our ability. If we don't have an answer, then we'll find out. Okay, so I have to look here because um, I can't uh, see behind my eyes. Okay, so the 30th legislature is a big um, budget year because it is the first year of the fiscal biennium. Um, and your uh, legislature, and this is all means of funding or financing, uh, crafted uh, just over a $15 billion budget for fiscal year 20, as well as a, um, almost the same amount executive budget for 21. Now, the majority of funds that operate the state of Hawaii, in essence, the general fund, comes from several different sources. The largest uh, source, the largest piece of the pie is obviously, anyone, anybody, anybody want to take a guess? The largest piece of the piece of the pie. Taxes. General excise taxes. The GE tax is the largest amount of money that comes into the state, second only to income taxes. Not property, that's county, that's Sioux. <laughs> Income taxes, number two. Anybody want to guess what's number three? TAT, right? The rail. So we had all that dominated a year and a half ago, you know. We raised that now to 10.25%. So if you go stay in a hotel room down uh, on this island, rather than being 9.25%, it's now 10.25%, but that extra 1% being paid statewide going to Honolulu's drug project. And me and Kyle voted against it. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, was sunset 2029, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Um, so th those are pretty much the three biggest pots: the general excise tax, the um, income tax that we all pay on our earnings, as well as the TAT. Everything else is is really um, doesn't add that much to the pie. Now, what's really important is this. Um, this panel that is required by statute called the Council on Revenues. The Council on Revenues does uh, several times uh, through the year, and its members are appointed by the governor, is it looks at the total economic forecast of the state. It looks at um, some of the biggest economic drivers in the state, military and tourism. It looks at how many people are coming into the state in terms of tourism, how many people are staying in our hotels, what are the seat miles count, all of those things drive the Council on Revenues economic forecast for the current years and the out years. And what ended up happening this year was, in Governor Ige's budget that he had sent to the legislature, he had um, reduced the amount of expected revenues that would be coming in. I believe it was 3.5% is what he set that at. And we all thought at the beginning of the legislature that I was being really conservative. But that ended up to be pretty accurate because when the Council on Revenues came up with their um, revenue forecast, I believe it was around March, February, March, if 
I'm not mistaken, it was at 3%. It was lower than what even the governor had uh, predicted, which uh, is accurate when you look at what Uhero and Carl Bonham at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, who is also on the Council of Revenues, he's one of the top economic advisors in the state, they're forecasting an economic slowdown in the state of Hawaii in future years to come, whether it's driven by tourism or the construction industry. So this budget had to factor that in. But generally speaking, it's about a $15 billion budget. This is the biennium. Next year we'll come in to do a supplemental budget, which would be minor tweaks to this. Um, capital improvements, or CIPs, about $124 million were allocated to Hilo, and we'll show you what those were. Um, granted aids for nonprofits. I don't know how much nonprofits applied this year. 250 something like that. Yeah, and not very many received uh, granted aid. Some did, some didn't. You know, Boys and Girls Club was a, was a recipient of that. Um, and we'll talk about who received operating GIAs and who received CIP GIAs for Hilo. This is the budget pie. This is all means of financing. I'm going to show you an all means of financing pie and a general funds pie. So all means of financing if everything, federal funding, special funds. Um, Chris, you want to jump in on this? Sure, yeah. So in addition to the major revenue generation, which is, like you said, kind of the big three taxes, there's some smaller taxes that generate some money, uh, things like on fuel, <coughs> Um, but in addition to that, there are a lot of fees that are collected. So as an example, we have uh, DCCA, which deals with primarily with consumer protection. So if you uh, need to get your license renewed, not for driving your car, but if you're practicing, um, what's a good example? I think probably like if you're a barber or something like that, right? The DCCA handles a lot of licensure, and they collect fees which contribute to this piece of the pie. So it's not a large sum of money in comparison to you know, the big three taxes, but there are a lot of fees collected at state parks for parking or for entering um, a state park that all contributes toward this 15 and million. And that's important because what the state legislature has attempted to do over the last few years is really crack down on these special funds. Um, special funds are generated by departments, like the parks department, and then basically the department has somewhat carte blanche determine how they want to expend that funding. Uh, the problem with that is that it kind of got out of hand, and there are special funds everywhere, and there's not a lot of accountability. So the legislature has really made an effort to try and pare some of those down, to eliminate some special funds, and to not necessarily cut that funding, but make sure that it comes out of the larger pot, which we're going to discuss in a bit, which is the general fund, which is kind of just this general pot of money that the legislature then controls to appropriate so that there's a little bit more oversight. With all means of financing, you can see the pie allocation that gets the majority of the fund, uh, funding. Of course, the Department of Education, our DOE, gets almost $2.1 billion. Keep in mind, this is all means of financing. We'll show you what the general fund looks like. The University of Hawaii is $1.2 billion, but you know, half a billion dollars of that is, is research dollars and federal funding and other things that, that come in as well. Um, you can see retirement benefits is a billion dollars. Debt service on money that the state of Hawaii has borrowed to fund its CIP projects is almost a billion dollars. It's 900 million. Um, but I think a better uh, snapshot, since this is all means of financing, is the general fund. So this is straight up what's coming out of those three big pots of money, and this is what the state has to play with. Um, it's about. $8 billion now is the total appropriation. So you can see 1.7 billion or 23% of the pie is going to DOE. That's to fund our almost 290 public schools throughout the state. Um, their operational costs, teachers, everything. Um, you know, last year we had this big debate about um, taxing property taxes, right? To pay for um, education. Well, that was, uh, you know, that was a, a big issue that we dealt with um, last session, and that bill didn't go through. The University of Hawaii got a little over $517 million, um, and that's nearly not enough to scratch the surface at UH when they have almost a billion dollars in deferred maintenance at our university campuses. 
you know, our education, uh, this is, this 1.7 billion is not capital improvements. It's not CIP. So, um, $12 million that was allocated to Volcano School of Arts and Sciences Charter School, or to, what, $20 billion to, ha uh, $20 million to ha Hale Elementary up in uh, Pueo. That's not this. The $1.7 billion, that's to pay teacher salaries, that's for operation, that's weighted school, uh, weighted student formula, that's what that pays for. So, you can see where um, money is being spent. Uh, debt service, retirement, Medicaid, health, some of the smaller um, slices of the pie that are consistently underfunded, and we'll look at what CIP is, is like public safety, $271 million. Or the Department of Land and Natural Resources, I don't even see it, that it's up here. Hawaii Health System Corporation, $127 million, that goes to help fund Hilo Medical Center and the state's public hospitals across the state, Ka'u, um, Kohala. This is on the right side here, you can see the percentage and financing, the smaller numbers of the breakdown. So this is where departments, and if you have a particular department, we have some budget highlights. Like if you want to know, hey, what were some budget highlights from DLNR's budget, or from Department of Health, or Public Safety, we can come <coughs> in uh, we do the Q&A. But this side here shows 65 million going to the Department of Land and Natural Resources that represented less than 1% of the total budget. And there's a lot of stuff out there that DLMR manages from our harbors to our boat ramp. You know, if you're a fisherman and you launch from Wailoa boat ramp, you got major complaints at Wailoa, you know, along with building a new ramp down in Puna uh, because what was, uh, you know, what was colored and affected by the lava flow. But, um, Department of Hawaiian Homelands, 18.6 million, 0.23% of the overall budget. Interestingly enough, the Department of Hawaiian Homelands is the only department that is constitutionally mandated by the Hawaii State Constitution that it be funded um, by the state of Hawaii. Mm. And um, there was a long lawsuit over that called the Nelson case, and finally, um, State through the EDA administration is to the tune of about 20 to 25 million a year for operational funding of the Department of Hawaiian Homelands. Okay, some legislative highlights. I'm going to hand it over to Chris since these are uh, House bills. Which we both can talk to uh, House Bill 1180, which is probably the biggest uh, win for Hawaii Island, and that's the $60 million relief package. Um, to the county of Hawaii for volcanic relief. Do you want to talk to the person? Sure. Uh, so there's a little bit of confusion around the program that's called Kapuna Care. Yes. Uh, because we have a Kapuna Care program and we have a Kapuna Care Givers program, which is newer and kind of dominated a little bit of the news maybe two years ago, give or take. So Kapuna Care is aid that goes directly to um, Kapuna. So it deals with programs, adult daycare, um, that sort of thing. And so we have a substantial appropriation this year, about $4 million. And that's kind of, I guess, you know, when we look at well, how our state is aging, you know, I think what I like to tell was all my friends went away, right? So the state is aging very rapidly. We're already the oldest state in terms of our population, and that's only increasing as people retire here, but also as a lot of young people move away. Um, so that's kind of something that, in some ways, we've been putting a band-aid on. And we're not really dealing with it in the way that we should be dealing with it, because it's happening very rapidly. Um, so you have a lot of really good people who have stepped up and uh, are kind of offering services, but you know, what happens when that gets overwhelmed? So the state and the legislature is moving in the direction of advancing some legislation and programs that really are the first of its kind in the entire country. Um, so one example is the Kahuna Care Givers Program, which actually provides funding for people who are providing aid to an aging family member. Um, and the intent of that is, if you are uh, working full time and your work is being interrupted because you have to care for a loved one, the state will actually provide funding so that you can have someone come in and wash clothes, or you can have a nurse come in, or you know, whatever really services are required, or whether it's adult daycare for a day of the week, so that you can continue to work and earn an income 
Because part of what we're trying to address is that there are a lot of numbers out there that show that if you're caring for a loved one who you know, has a lot of health concerns, that your life expectancy declines very rapidly because of the stress and the toll that takes on you as a family. So what we're seeing is that in some cases, people who are caring for a spouse, as an example, who might be in worse physical condition, actually end up passing before their spouse <coughs> dies. So the caregivers program, which isn't mentioned here, but is kind of it's kind of like the part B to this, is something that Hawaii uh, moved on two years ago, and we're continuing to fund, and we're the only state in the country that actually does that. So we are trying to move in the right direction on that, but you know, I think if you ask you know, all of us at the legislature, we probably need to be doing more, especially in a town like Hilo, where we're probably a little bit older on average than most of the state is actually, because we have a lot of families that have stayed here, and really, you know, we're, we have a lot of multi-generational households, as an example. Uh, so, you know, hopefully we can continue to address that um, going forward. Yeah, we work very closely with um, Dr. Kimo Alameda and the county's Office of Aging, through the interim to talk about how we can help our Kapuna care program. You know, we know that a lot of our Kapuna, our parents are aging and keeping them active, allowing them to have healthy lifestyles, um, proper nutrition is very, very important. And, and you see some of that already happening in Hilo. You see the Hawaii Adult Daycare Center that has now opened up on the corner of Komohana. There's a significant amount of state funding that went into that through the grant and aid process. Yeah. And that's a fantastic facility. If you had gone to their old facility at Hilo, the old Hilo Hospital, huh? you would be shocked at what it looks like now. And so that's, that's a great example of public-private partnership coming <coughs> together for our kupuna. And our ultimate goal is that no kupuna um, should ever be left alone, should ever be at home by themselves, should ever go hungry, should never have to worry about medication or that somebody cares about them. And so that's what we're trying to do uh, every day. Okay, Hospital 1180. Uh, we adjourned last legislative session. This is how this went down, right? The gavel literally went down, and I'm sitting in my office at about 4.15 p.m. I have like a, I think I'm going back to Honolulu Hilo uh, about 7 o'clock at night. Somebody comes into my office, one of my uh, office members, and says, are you looking at Facebook? And I'm like, no. It's like, you got to look at Ikaika Marzo's page. Leilani Estates is on fire. It's erupting. I'm like, what? I literally pull up Facebook. I mean, chicken skin right now. And I can't believe what I'm seeing. I grab my phone and my keys, and I literally go straight to the governor's office. I walk into the governor's office. Go to the secretary and I say, I need to see the governor right now. She's like, I'm like, it's an emergency. I need to see him right now. And you happen to be there. Out comes the governor. And uh, I'm like, Governor, are you, do you know what's <coughs> happening right now in Lilania States on Hawaii Island? He's like, no. I'm like, look at this. And we literally sat in his office for a few minutes and watching Kaika Marzo's live stream of fishers opening up in Leilani Estates. And that was the beginning of what would be a life-changing event for this island and for the entire community of Puna and for many of us in this room uh, that went through almost four months of that and continued to go through it every day. Um, within a week, we had brought the state senate and the state representative house leadership into, into Puna. And um, the eruption had actually subsided when they came, so there wasn't any active flow to see, but it had already done incredible damage just in the week that it had erupted. They came, they saw, you know, it was just in its infancy, right? We didn't know what was going to happen. We never knew 700 homes would be destroyed, PGV would be surrounded by lava, roads would be cut off, boat ramps would be cut off, all of Lower Puna's agricultural tropical fresh ornamental flowers, papaya industry decimated. That was all to come. And, uh, and so, you know, even though they came on a week later, you know, working for a funding relief package and working through that to the interim, waiting for the eruption to stop, waiting for it to cool, figuring out what's going on, what Mayor Kim's role was gonna be, and what he, his vision was for Laura Puna. Of course, the county council, 
This is what we came up with, House Bill 1180, which was a $60 million package for Hawaii County. Um, a large amount of it is going to be reimbursed uh, because of the federal funding <coughs> component uh, that will be um, repaid uh, when those monies come in. One of the triggers we put in here was we wanted to make sure that the administration was working with the council. And so we just didn't want to give a $60 million blank check to the administration. Not that we didn't trust the administration, but we wanted to make sure that they were working in communication with the council and the representatives from that area. Councilman Kirkowitz, Leloy, you know, others. And so that's what we did. And so in order for the administration to expand funds, they have to get council approval. Is that correct? It's correct. And that was uh, really important for us to do. And so now the County of Hawaii has the opportunity to figure out how we can best help Lower Puna recover and what we want that to look like. There's a lot of things happening, of course, you know, PGB wants to come back online. We saw the PUC letter that they had sent. We have some money in here for plans design for a new pier down in uh, Puna, a new boat ramp, because we understand how affected the fishermen of Lower Puna have been. They can't fish, right? You can't launch and fish from Wai from Wailo and run all the way down to Keao and Kumukahi. It's just not practical. So we need to open up a ramp down in Lower Puna. So we have some plans design money for that. You want to talk about anything else for the Sure. Yeah. Just a little bit of an extra perspective on the whole ramp issue. Uh, because it's been coming up a lot. So, you know, that's something we really fought for this year is to make sure that something's at least in the works. Um, but I don't think a lot of people realize it. So I, I used to run Suisun Fish Market. And I would say that if you look at East Hawaii's commercial fish supply, about 40% came from that one boat ramp. Um, so you're talking about a substantial, that, that's not only just, you know, for consumers, harder to get poke, everything's more expensive, but that's a lot of people's actual livelihoods. Um, and going into, you know, what Kai was saying, you know, it's not practical to burn all that fuel, it's also just not economical to go and fish if you're going to launch from Hilo. But beyond that, a lot of the boats that previously launched out of Lower Puna are not equipped for the rougher seas on this side, so they can't physically do it. Um, so that's something, there's obviously a lot of frustration, and we're trying to do everything we can um, so basically where the state is at right now is that it's site identification, uh, which sounds terrible. That doesn't sound like we're going to break ground tomorrow on the local ramp. Um, but they believe that they've identified a site, and that's basically the process right now. So the question we get asked for right now is, um, there's obviously some divided opinion on, well, there's a new beach there, right? So some of the fishermen want us to dredge that up so that they can launch. DLNR told us it would take about $15 million to do that. And that, that's their conservative estimate. Not just to complete the work, but they believe that if they complete the work, it will basically continue to be inundated by new sand. So that it's not really an option for us to do it at the existing site, unless we're going to leverage tremendous amounts of <coughs> funding. Um, and then beyond that, I did want to give a special thanks on that to Senator Russell Ruderman, who was a constant advocate from day one. Um, I really helped advance uh, the funding. And then beyond that, uh, Rep. Sam Buenaventura, who I, I believe, because I was in the room when that happened, okay. uh, the last $10 million of that $60 million, I believe, can be directly credited to her. Because it was going to be $50 million, and she made the ask, and that's how it turned into $60 million. Um, so we're really hoping that that money gets spent wisely, and we really believe in the council and their direction, um, and that uh, they're really going to help us out on that end. Uh, in addition to this, Governor Ike appropriated two appropriations, <coughs> almost $22 million of emergency funds to the county of Hawaii while the eruption was ongoing. Uh, it was difficult for the legislature to look at a special session or coming back into session to address it until we knew what the county's long-term plans was, until the, the actual eruption activity stopped, so we knew what the um, damage assessment was, and we waited for FEMA and our other federal agencies to weigh in on well, what we can do now. Um, but some, like uh, Rep. Todd said, Rep. Uh, Representative Rudiman, key. Um, Councilman Kleinfeder, uh, Kirkowitz working together with Representative San Juan This is their district, right? So we wanted them to be the drivers and telling us what the community needs because they know the pulse of the community in Lower Puna. Of course, Mr. Lyman, Lono Lyman, and the Lyman family, 
they own a lot of that lower Puna lands, especially the ones that papaya farmers were farming that all got cut off. Shipment Estate um, was, was uh, involved as well because of their land holdings in Keao and possibly moving new housing to Keao. I know um, that was something we had talked about with them as well. But there's no question, restoring infrastructure, <coughs> restoring roads, restoring access, utilities um, needs to happen in, in the near term to get this community back to some um, sort of um, sense of normalcy. We also have to be mindful that this eruption happened before Kapoho in the 60s. This eruption happened again in 2019, and uh, it, it, it will happen in the future. The, the East Rift Zone is active, period. And you take a risk if you decide to live down there, even though it's, it's um, a very, very beautiful place. But restoring our agriculture industry is important as well. Many papaya farmers and uh, ornamental flowers and thuriums all devastated. Um, and so working with them in the Department of Agriculture has been a goal of ours as well. Uh, Chris likes to talk about cannabis, so I'm going to let him talk about Hospital 1383. Uh, okay, so I have no idea, I have no idea what three grams was. I asked some friends, apparently it's not a lot. Uh, so, Does anybody know what three grams is? Two joints! <laughs> and then uh, that got posted online as part of an article. Some people commented that's too small. <laughs> so I have no idea, really. Um, but we passed HP 1383. And just to give you like a brief overview of the path of this legislation, there were competing visions. At one point, there was a full legalization bill on the table. There were multiple decriminalization bills. And basically, what ended up passing was out of all of the decriminalization bills passed across the country, this is the smallest amount that is decriminalized, and it is the highest fine, is my understanding. <laughs> um, I think, so, now okay, I'm sure we have competing views in this room on how we feel about this, but the way this was crafted was doing part to what we believed would be potentially veto power. <coughs> Okay, so if you are an advocate who wants to see decriminalization or wants to see full legalization one day, depending on where you fall on that issue, the intent of this bill is to pass something that would be difficult for the governor to veto because it's the smallest amount of all the bills and because it's the highest fine, so it would therefore carry the least amount of public concern. Um, that's not going to be shared by everyone, and there are people, you know, I mean, that's my opinion. <laughs> That's my wife being very patient. <laughs> um, but um, that's kind of how we ended up with this. And I think when it passed out of the house, the fine was a little bit lower, and that was already the highest fine. Uh, so it's the smallest bite of the apple of the apple possible while still passing the decriminalization bill. Um, now what's important for those who may partake or know people who do is if you get caught with more than three grams. Nothing has changed. So this isn't decriminalization of all marijuana possession or use. It is only if you have three grams or less. Anything above that, no, no changes in statute. And that's important. You know, uh, that was a big topic of discussion this year. You had uh, Senator Carl Rhodes. He was a judiciary chair. Uh, Representative Chris Lee was a judi judiciary chair. There was talk that maybe. Um, uh, legalization of marijuana would be on the table this year, as has other states done throughout the country. Um, every year, legislation gets introduced, just like gaming, uh, and every year it doesn't pass. Um, but nevertheless, keeping people out of prisons and jails for um, <coughs> minor issues like this uh, was something the legislature wanted to address this year, and so it did. So this bill is headed to the governor's desk as well. All of these bills, if not already signed into law, are headed to the governor's desk. We know that House Bill 1180 has been signed into law. Okay, Senate Bill 464. We'll talk some Senate bills now. This bill authorizes a uh, property owner to go onto an adjacent property uh, if you have Aldesia trees under certain conditions. So Senator Rudiman, uh, we all remember Hurricane Acell and what happened with Albizia trees that are all over this uh, East Hawaii where, um, you know, they 
fell out, man, and they, they fought on very easily. And so this is a, a bill that was passed that would allow um, a property owner to go to the adjacent property to remove the tree if it was a um, threat to their property, providing there was a written notice and it was resolved, uh, by a licensed arborist. Anything on Havisia? 471 uh, was for homelessness services, $14.8 million to help with our outreach, rapid rehousing, housing first. So this is a um, you know housing package to address Hawaii's homeless issue and look at different types of solutions to address homeless, whether it's housing first or rapid rehousing um, to get people into some type of housing program, even if the state has to supplement their rent to get them on their feet. You know, we know that um, having a roof over your head and a clean bed to sleep in, um, you know, is something that we all desire to have. And many people sleep in their cars and sleep at Mohiao Park, the downtown Hilo, and in Honolulu, it's an epidemic. And uh, we can do better, and, and so these are opportunities to do that. If you've had a chance to read the Star Advertiser the last few days, this is like a six-part series in um, homelessness being led by Lieutenant Governor Josh Green. And today was another good article in that. Senate Bill 1353, this is something that I think is, uh, can be great for East Hawaii. We talked about restored agriculture in Puna, and that's our industrial hemp program. Um, this has been something that Senator Gabbard, Mike Gabbard in the Senate, has, has championed for years and years and years. His industrial hemp, Representative Thielen, big industrial hemp fan and uh, its potential um, uh, that it can provide to the state and to our agricultural in industry is tremendous. And so initially it was a pilot program, uh, limited to 10 acres, certain licenses, specific seed types, depending on if you were growing hemp for industrial materials or CBD oil or feed for nutritional products, uh, for baking and goods. Uh, we've opened it up a lot more now administered by the Department of Agriculture. Hemp is fantastic, uh, and it grows very quick. Hawaii can be one of the top states to grow it. You can harvest it four times a year. Um, byproducts of that are a multi-purpose manufacturing or processing facility. You can do value-added products. CBD oil is um, uh, you know, one of the items that you can use as far as uh, building materials. It's, it's, it's terrific. Um, it can also be used to um, regenerate soils. So as we see um, former plantation lands in East Maui, Alexander and Baldwin's lands, lands here in Hamakua that used monocropping for many, many, many years and the soil was just all of its nutrients taken out, pesticides put in, uh, over years and years and years of growing sugar. Um, industrial hemp or hemp is a great way to plant, regenerate soils, and pull all that stuff up that's uh, in our soils today. So that bill is also headed to the government's desk. Okay, Chris, uh, CIP for Hilo. Sure. Uh, so there's an article that came out recently, basically just detailing a lot of the projects that we got uh, funded for Hilo. And, you know, we're, I guess every year I've been in, so maybe this happens all the time, um, I'm enjoying it. It really seems like Hilo, we got more than our fair share in a sense of uh, funding coming into the community. Uh, so part of that's going to be substantial for improvements at our airport, um, which, you know, depending on where you are in the airport, it's kind of an untenable situation right now. Um, and that's pretty much statewide. Um, I don't travel much. Uh, Kai's a pilot, so he's been everywhere. And I think he might have a better perspective on just how far behind we are, especially as being a major tourist destination. Uh, but, you know, in the very limited traveling I've done, we probably have the worst airports of any major city. Well, with the airport, I mean, you've all noticed the new parking lot. Yeah. Right? New parking lot, you have covered areas over the um, toll booths. I know they changed all the gutters. You have the cargo facility now. Um, you know, one thing that, that many may have not noticed that I find uh, very promising is the new FedEx cargo facility. You know, FedEx specifically chose not to be in the Hilo car, the cargo facility that we built that houses Aloha Cargo, Trans Air, DOA, Hawaiian Airlines. They decided to build their own. For FedEx to invest that much money in that facility, which is right across the post office, 
shows that they've done economic analysis of, of Hilo, and I'm hoping that we start seeing FedEx planes and those big planes coming back. Because that means that we are bringing in goods and we're sending away goods, whether it's Big Island candies or anthuriums or whatever. We're um, growing and developing here in East Hawaii. People are buying them and they're going all over the world. So the cargo facility is a big improvement as well as um, improvements at, on our runway <coughs> and things like that. You've all seen Southwest is, is looking to come to Hilo and provide service. So that's an opportunity to modernize our gates and do that as well. You know, we have United Airlines that comes here a couple times a week. Chris and I would like to see, you know, Hawaiian Airlines doing LA, Hilo, San Fran, Hilo, Vegas, Hilo. Um, you know, and so we'll see. You know, we're, we're working on that as well. But that's, uh, that's the airport. And what's really important to highlight with these CIP projects, this is jobs. This is Isimoto. This is, yeah, this is, this is all the big construction companies in Hilo that get an opportunity in East Hawaii to bid on these major state projects and keep our people to work. You know, as we start winding down the College of Pharmacy building, that $30 million facility, they're looking for the next project to already start bidding on. So this is a well, way that we keep our people at, uh, and our community um, at work. Hilo Harbor, do you want to move on to the next one? Oh yeah, so Hilo Harbor is similar. You know, there's a kind of a long-term plan. This would move, well, in the long term, what they're doing is they're trying to expand the production of that. I guess from the current harbor location, closer towards Banyan Drive area. That's kind of the next area right there. Part of it is just for capacity reasons, and part of it is if you are docking a cruise ship right now, they get off the boat, and they walk through kind of an industrial area to get anywhere, and there's no sidewalk, it's just not a good situation. So this money helps, you know, kind of head us in the right direction, kind of similar to the airport money. Um, but this is a very long-term project. You know, when I talk to guys at the uh, harbors, they're saying this is like a 10-year thing. This is kind of a long-term vision. Um, and then beyond that, you know, we're trying to really invest a lot in boat harbors because not just at Wailoa, but there's significant problems in Akahoehoe, in Punalulu, and we just lost, you know, probably the most important uh, boat harbor for commercial fishing in East Hawaii. So we're hoping that that 500,000 at least goes to trying to improve our existing services that we're providing. Uh, for a lot of these fishermen, um, but not, not only fishermen, for guys who just are docking or launching out of the level. Um, 250,000 East Hawaii Preservation Center. Many of you probably have no idea what this is or where this is, but this is DLNR's Shipty Office in East Hawaii, State Historic Preservation Division that currently exists right now, right in the Hilo Industrial Area, um, right around the corner from Chica Nakamos. It's a blue building. It's where Shipty has all of its records and, and uh, archaeological uh, documents. If you were doing an EIS or you wanted to search for a particular map um, that goes back, you know, historic documents, you can go there and do research there and um, it's completely falling apart. Uh, they have a collection that sits under a, um, a building that is completely falling down and if you drove by there now you'll see a 40 foot <coughs> container or a 20 foot container in the parking lot. We were responsible for that because we want them to move that collection of historic artifacts uh, that are potentially going to be damaged from the elements into this container and eventually into a new facility. And so that $250,000 is to do that. We were already in conversations with the University of White Hilo and Bob Masuda at DLNR and how can we get UH Hilo's, um, whether it's archaeology or anthropology or the different, pro uh, different program married up with DLNR so we can sort through this collection <coughs> categorize it, get rid of what we don't need, and, and look for a um, good partnership with students here at UH Hilo to work on uh, the, the, the office at Shipley. So that's the East Hawaii Preservation Center. Um, go for it. No, go for it. Yeah, they serve a ball fuel tank installation that's um, also down there as well, and it's a $150,000 um, project, small project. Uh, education. These are our public schools. If you went around East Hawaii and you just guess, anybody know how old Kapilani School is? Almost a hundred years old. Waikewaina School, hundred years old. All of our schools are like, like beyond 75 years old and it's, it's showing their age, uh, you know, is, is needs major, major CIP improvements 
Hilo Intermediate, the main building. I don't know what building is that. A building. A building. It's like tilting backwards. Like the, you can walk up to the main steps and see the gap between the building. I mean, it's crazy. Um, major CIP. But these are some CIP in, uh, projects for um, Hawaii Island, East Hawaii. 22.7 million. This is going to be great. High elementary, you know, know where that is. That's in Pueo. On the left side and on the side of the road, they're going to get a four classroom building and a library. Um, Keokawa Elementary School, uh, AC and Affordable. Keokawa has been doing pretty good. You know, we got a nice commercial kitchen down there in Keokawa. We got uh, covered walkways. We're getting AC down there. You know, Kumu Stacy Bell works really hard. They're doing a great job in the Keokawa community, and so that's a little bit of money for them. Um, Hilo Intermediate. Jump in here anywhere you want, Chris. Oh, sure. So what you see this year is a lot of smaller corporations, and that's intentional. Uh, basically what happened was, right before we went the session, it was revealed that the DOE had about $850 million deferred maintenance problem. Mm -hmm. And that they originally thought it was like $250 million. Uh, so that's not great, right? Um, so what we did this year is we made a really conscious effort with our CIP funding in two areas. One was towards addressing the deferred maintenance problem, and we were actually asked, at least I was on the house side, hey, instead of asking for these really big ticket items, ask for money that goes toward deferred maintenance because we really need to make more of a push on that. And it doesn't look as good on a canteen flyer, right? But it's probably more important right now that we address this um, instead of trying to get new buildings built, deal with what we already have. Um, and then the second part of that ties into the $5 million at the end. And that is that uh, the state is currently being sued for Title IX violations. Uh, not necessarily for anything that's on our island. It's more to do with what's happening on Wahoo and Campbell High School and other high schools, um, particularly on that side of the island, where they didn't have adequate facilities for the girls' locker rooms, for the change in, things like that. Um, so we really made a bigger push this year towards addressing some of that inequality. Um, in addition to the $5 million, which is going to go to what I'm assuming is the fanciest girls' locker room ever built. Um, <laughs> So we're working, we're working on the details of that. <laughs> but the figure came from them, we didn't just pull it out of the sky, right? Um, but in addition to that, uh, this happened, sometimes Sometimes we do things and we can directly point and be like, yeah, I got that done. Uh, and sometimes things just happen and it's a great coincidence. So this year at Kapiolani Elementary, um, you guys familiar with the baseball field out there? Okay, so they have a couple of problems. Uh, part of it is that homeless guys just walk onto the campus because there's um, in a little covered area, right, in the dugouts. Um, beyond that, I was thinking, you know, what we really don't have in Hilo is softball. Um, not just for Kukuna, but more particularly for girls' sports, right? We have all these softball teams, we have kids getting scholarships, we have a great college team here, um, and a low, but they're really playing on baseball fields, or they're playing at, I think, Kamehameha or UH Hilo. Um, so, I, I, I looked at the Kukuna fields and was like, man, it would be great if that was a softball facility that the teams could use, um, both at youth sports and when they high school. And then it just fell out of the budget. Um, my asset. So, fantastic. So, $750,000 for uh, basically converting that to a softball field and making improvements, partially for safety of the students there, um, but also for, you know, for future events and games, that sort of stuff. Yep. You know, when Chris talked about the girls' athletic locker rooms at Waikia High School, I mean, Waikia High School is built in the late 70s, and I think their first class was 1980. So that school is almost 40 years old. Yeah. Um, 150 grand White Elementary School. You'll see if you drove by White Care, you look um, where the parking lot is. They have a covered play court coming up. Former Councilman Fresh Onishi uh, got some asphalt to make a parking lot area there. And this is to get White Care Elementary a little bit more um, uh, uh, playground equipment for the kids there. <coughs> Uh, UH, 13 million for plans, design, construction, equipment for improvements at uh, the University of Waikino. There's a breakdown on this, but this uh, um, was a request from UH Hilo for various things on campus. Two things we really important for us to highlight is the University of Hawaii um, Daniel Kano School of Pharmacy. So any of you are far familiar with the present facility and those modular facilities, that was in dire need of an upgrade, I guess you could say, a major uh, capital construction. So as we 
get ready to open the College of Pharmacy and bless the building for the fall of 2019. We're going to open it on August 26th. 26th. In a few months. Yeah. $30 million project. Uh, we're going to move that school to the new building, but those modular uh, buildings are still going to be used for the College of Pharmacy, and this $3 million will go for that. That was really, really important. Uh, and then something that's near and dear to my heart is the University of Hawaii Hilo Aeronautical Sciences Program. And the 321000 in CIP uh, is going to go to fund two simulators, um, motion simulators, and two desktop simulators, as well as additional equipment for the program. Where this program is, uh, it has been approved by the Board of Regents. Where I had hoped it would have started in the fall of 2019. It's probably going to start in January of 2020. The last hurdle we're waiting for is to get WASC approval. And that application is sitting at WASC. That stands for the Western... Okay, yeah. Basically, it's an accrediting agency for UH Hilo. They need to approve all new programs. They will need to approve this program. Application sitting there, waiting for approval. Once we get it done, we can start accepting students and get ready to go. But importantly, we needed some operational money for positions. We also needed capital money for equipment. We got the capital money this year, $321,000. Okay, we will go through about three slides here. This is everything. Uh, 250 something million dollars for all of Hawaii Island in CIP funding for the whole um, island, all districts. We'll just throw this up here and you can take a look at it. Um, <coughs> What you'll see out here is a lot of schools, right? Remember that pie? A lot of our money, a lot of your taxes goes to the Department of Education. And charter schools got a decent amount of money this year, year as well. Yeah. Up in Kohala. Our deep water harbors, very important, Kauai High and uh, Hilo. You know, most of our goods that you and I buy every day at Target and Walmart and Safeway, they don't get flown in. That's just the bread. They come in by ship. So we need good working people on harbors. Amakua. So DLNR can now use this money to solicit uh, a consultant, an environmental consultant, and to look at uh, what a new boat ramp in Lower Puna would look like, where would it be located, how much would it cost, what would it take to do an EIS, all those things. This was an interesting one that popped up, uh, Volcano School of Arts and Sciences, charter school, got $15 million uh, for new facilities, and that's great. Because typically charter schools don't get any capital money. Mauna Kea, million dollars to modify and replace ungulate exclusion fence. We know that uh, if you've ever had a chance to drive on the um, DKI, that you see ungulates and uh, all over the place. If you want to thank the two guys responsible for the $250 million for Hawaii Island, these guys, not us. We put in our requests, we put in our asks, we have no idea what we're going to get. These guys do. Senator Gil Agaran on the left, he's the vice chair of the Senate Ways and Means Committee. There's his email, there's his number. Quick email, mahalo, we'll go a long way. And I really mean that, I'm not, I'm not joking. Um, on the House side, Representative Prao Yamashita, 
there's his information as well. These guys work really hard on a billion dollar CIP budget, not just for our island, for the entire state. They also represent uh, Maui. And so you would think that Maui would get the lion's share of CIP funding. It's, it's not that way. They um, allocated it very evenly and apportioned throughout the state. But these are the gentlemen that we can thank for Hawaii Island's $243 million CIP funding. Grant and Aves, Chris. Sure. Uh, so the Grant and Aves process, you have about 250 nonprofits in a given year. They come in with all sorts of requests. Uh, so you have some that are for operations. Um, so hey, we need to put this program on. We need $100,000 to do that. Maybe it's uh, supplies, or we need some sort of expertise or equipment. And then we also have capital improvement grant and aid requests. So those are for uh, community centers, anything structural um, that needs to get built. Um, and I think in a given year, it's about $30 million in total. Uh, <coughs> appropriated and uh, Senator, well, I guess the slide will be later, but Senator Arbor on the Senate side, Andrew says, and on the House side, this area was uh, Representative Nishimoto, who represents the Kaimuki area. Um, and, you know, hey, same thing. We, we, we've done pretty well in the past um, in getting money for ELO for our nonprofits, and this year is no exception. Um, you know, so we have $300,000 for uh, Big Island Resource Conservation and Development Council, $100,000 for BISAC. Um, $500,000 for the Boys and Girls Club of Big Island. Um, that is specific to the Kilo Club. Um, part of what's happening, if you're not completely aware, you know, because I went to the Boys and Girls Club growing up, right, um, is that right now they have a program in place where if you go to the Boys and Girls Club, first off, you're paying the same annual fee that they've been paying for the last 50 years. It's $10 for a year, uh, which is incredible. Um, but beyond that, they are providing a free meal every day to all the kids at the Boys and Girls Club, which is, which is amazing. Um, so part of what they're trying to do is clean up you know, some ADA issues, some of the facilities are kind of falling apart, uh, things like paving. This was a three and a half million dollar request, uh, and that's what they really need, but this is the chunk we were able to get for them this year. Um, but beyond that, what they'd like to do is take the meals that they're currently cooking, because they have the kitchen facilities and everything like that, and they'd like to be able to expand that service to their other clubs. And they can pretty much get to the East Hawaii clubs if they're able to get some more funding. They can cook everything on site here and transport it to KL and um, other places. <coughs> so this is a pretty big deal. Yeah, part of the um, strength, I think, of the Big Island Boys and Girls Club application, because they did ask for $3 million, and as you can see, they got $500,000, um, was its leadership uh, under Chad Cabral and the um, Basically, the board and the team there who have done a fantastic job at Boys and Girls uh, Club of the Big Island. You know, they uh, basically took in Kuo Kala Charter School down in Lower Puna, right? Half of it is at Nani Mao, the other half is over here. You know, and they didn't have anywhere to go, and uh, they were welcomed there with open arms, and they've done a fantastic job. So um, uh, uh, we were proud to support. Uh, that, that initiative and that request. Um, and finally, 150,000 to the Hawaii Island Portuguese Chamber of Commerce. They are, have been in a multi-year process to build a uh, culture and educational center at the corner of Kona Hawaii Street and Komohana. Uh, Mr. Deleuze donated the property. It's right across from the medical center and uh, our, uh, Marlene, Archie <coughs> Hapai, and their team have been uh, working really hard to bring it to fruition and I've seen their plans and uh, when they do build it, it's going to be an amazing gathering place and an awesome place to showcase our rich Portuguese cultural heritage and the migration of the Portuguese from the Azores and from Portugal uh, to the Hawaiian Islands, to Hilo. Uh, the ship logs they have are incredible and so it's going to be a great place. Traditional Portuguese baking oven, um, you know, malasadas, it's going to be awesome. So, <laughs> yeah, uh, so that's um, that track. They, they are relentless. They come back every single year. They, they chip away. And, uh, um, yeah, they, they uh, work really, really hard. Okay, uh, two bills, priority bills for Chris. 
Sure. Uh, so every year we put in our bills. Uh, this year I put in 20 on the house side. If you're not a chair on the house side, you pretty much are capped at 20 for this past year. Um, unless you ask for special exceptions. And some guys end up with like 50, but uh, no one's got 50 with right? So put in my 20. So this original is HP 1548. What happened was we actually had a site visit. Uh, this is above Kumani Prison. All the way at the top, the helicopter us in. Uh, because you can't get access to where we need to get access to. And basically to showcase uh, some of the rapid gave death problems, kind of what they're doing right now, um, some of the unique situations up there. And uh, so this $750,000, a big majority of that will be for Hawaii Island, some will be for Kauai. And it's basically to help stem some of the expansion of rapid gave death. Um, right now there's tons of money being pumped into research, we at least have a good idea of what's causing this now. And now the question is going to be, how do we stop it from spreading? And that's a very complicated answer right now. So we're hoping that in continuing the funding, they can really uh, you know, take a substantial step forward. Um, because our watershed really depends on, depends on the Ohio. And that's kind of the future of the Big Island is maintaining a lot of that native Ohio forest. Um, not just for us, but for obviously for the wildlife too. Um, and then, you know, beyond that, uh, HP 1547. So, what happened was, uh, before the session started, I met with Coach Rolovich. Uh, we knew each other a little bit through the football coaches, you know, connection kind of thing, right? And we basically asked him, hey, you know, we, we like what you're doing, a lot of people have committed, we appreciate your loyalty to the state, because he very easily could have left and probably made triple his salary as a companion, um, if went to like San Jose State or a school like that. Uh, so what can we do to help you, you know, kind of reward some of what you're trying to do there? And he said that the kids need to eat better. Um, and that they don't get fed enough, and that NCAA regulations allow students, student athletes, to get more food, and UH is not currently providing that. So, you know, part of it is, it's a question of, hey, do we want a long-term future for athletics in Hawaii? And if the answer is yes, we need to do a better job at um, maintaining our current program, but also helping to, to grow it. And this seemed like something attainable. It's like, well, we're not going to pump money into coaches' salaries or administrative loan or marketing. It's going to go to feeding the kids more. Uh, so it's not $4 million for free food, though. Uh, it was a $3 million appropriation that they were already receiving, um, but that was on a year-to-year -year basis. So we were able to make that recurring as a base part of their budget, so it provides them a little bit more stability. And with that additional $1 million, uh, UH Hilo is going to get $100,000, which will go primarily towards those student meals and you know, things that they need. And then of that $900,000, a substantial chunk will go to feeding the kids better. And then they're really going to have to justify any, any additional expense um, that comes out of that pot of money. So I met with uh, Calvert Young from the University System today, and it seems like everything's on the right track in that way. Do you think you're Hilo? About $100,000. $100,000. Yeah. This is a bill you offer, right? Yeah, so that four million UH UH was already receiving uh, UH three hundred thousand of three million, and so that's now four hundred thousand of the four million. So they'll see a little bit of growth and a little bit more uh, comfort in that. And that's you know fantastic that that this is a bill that Chris uh, authored and came up with and championed, and uh, it's going to really help our uh, student athletes at UH Hilo and UH Manoa. Someone who was a former student athlete at UH Manoa in the 1990s, I know how um, critical meal plans are and healthy meals and, um, and, and food and snacks. And so it's a great job. It's awesome. Uh, two bills for, that I wanted to highlight are relating to human services. So this is an appropriation of almost a half a million dollars for our University of Hawaii um, Hawaii Nutrition Employment and Training Program, and that's basically to uh, provide materials and supplies and positions to uh, support the student support positions. Uh, Chris, I think, did a great segue to point of caregivers, that's Senate Bill 1025, and uh, just like he had mentioned before, you know, this program is going to allocate and appropriate almost a million and a half dollars to our component caregivers program. And this is what I had mentioned works very closely with Dr. Kim Alameda at the Office of Aging. Um, if there were two bills that 
I disappointed we weren't able to get done. It's these two right here. <coughs> Senate Bill 911, 911, right? You're in an emergency, what do you do? <coughs> Call 911. Thought it was a great number for a great bill. And that was going to be to appropriate um, about $2 million to the Hilo Cardiac uh, Center to HMC. Uh, we got them funding last year. And with that money, they um, have been uh, securing cardiologists and standing up the center at, U uh, at HMC. And the basic gist of it is, is that if you are having a stroke or if you are having a heart attack, that you can go to Hilo Medical Center and get a cardiac angioplasty stent done to open up the clot in your heart and save your life. Um, we are not able to do that procedure here. If you have a heart attack here, all they can do is give you medication, similar to, I hate to say it, but using um, Drano in a clogged pipe to remove the blockage. They can it give works. you that medication. It works. It works. <laughs> yeah. And put you on a helicopter uh, for maybe $75,000 to take a 220 mile flight to Honolulu. Or put you in an airplane if it's available and immediately fly you to Queens or uh, one of the hospitals on Oahu so that you can then get the stent done there if you still require it. Um, this was a bill that I put in and unfortunately made it to conference but never got funding. It's okay because that bill, like the next bill, uh, is still alive and moves on to the next legislative session and can be picked up right in conference. Because it's the new biennium, new budget, new slate of bills. So any bill that was introduced this past year, if it didn't make it to the governor's desk, wherever it never made it out of, maybe it never it got a hearing, or maybe it got a couple hearings in the Senate but never made it to the House, or maybe they made it out of the Senate, went into the House and never got a hearing there, or maybe made it all the way to conference and died there, which is where these two bills um, never got funded, they carry over to next year. So both of these bills went to both the Senate and the House, they are still alive, and they can be picked up immediately next session um, if um, that is the will of the House and Senate. House Bill 1219 uh, would have been a new solution for Banyan Drive relating to public lands. Um, you know, this is something that we have consistently kicked out the uh, can down the road the last uh, few years and we haven't been able to solve this, this issue. And it just isn't in the Senate or it's not just in the House exclusively. You know, the governor put, I want to say six million dollars in his executive budget in CIP, in DLNR's budget, to tear down Uncle Billy's. And that never made it into the final budget in CIP. So Uncle Billy's will stay for another year, vacant and, you know, vermin ridden and uh, it's got to come down, you know, but in order to take down Uncle Billy's you need to do an EIS. Uh, it's in the SMA, it's near the shoreline. Yeah, there's a lot of work before you even can start taking down the Uncle Billy's Hotel when it needs to come down. Um, this bill, what it would have done, would have been to sunset and um, repeal the County of Hawaii uh, established Banyan Drive Redevelopment Agency and would have created, in essence, a new redevelopment agency under the auspices of the Department of Land and Resources. The trigger for this bill was uh, just like the existing BDHRA is how was it going to be funded? And so what this bill would have done, it would have appropriated $200,000 in initial seed money to get it going. But more importantly, it would have taken 50% of all of the revenues generated on the Bandon Drive Peninsula annually out of DLNR's budget to fund the redevelopment of Bandon Drive, which is almost a million dollars a year. Nani Loa, Hilo Hawaiian, the three condo towers, Bay Shore, Reeves Bay, Mr. Inoy, and Bayview. Um, uh, restaurant, Nihon Restaurant, Hilo um, you know, Bay Cafe, they all pay ground rent, right? With Nani Loa paying the most. Nani Loa pays almost $600,000 
a year in annual payments because they have the 70 acre golf course. So what this bill would have done would have taken almost a half million dollars out of DLNR's existing ground rent money that goes to their land division to fund the redevelopment, which I wasn't opposed to, but of course, who would be adamantly opposed to that? The DLNR. They're like, look, we, know, we, we only have 0.8% of the whole budget and now you want to take 50% of the land division money? I'm like, hey, well, we got to do something with land jar. And so this bill moves to next year and um, the House and Senate have both agreed on language and funding, and so I'm really confident that uh, we can get this going. And we'd also receive assurances from the county and the council that they would move forward if this bill is enacted to repeal the existing Bannon Drive redevelopment agency. So we are not giving up the Bannon Drive um, list to find another day. Okay. Not bad, 20 minutes over. These are um, the contact information. Uh, emails, part three, phone number. My, I have a staff, like Chris Abbas has a staff now of um, two full timers. They work year round and they're constituent services and they're here to do their best to answer questions and field stuff to me um, so that we can do work in the interim. You know, Chris has his staff as well. What we do now, now that the legislature is out and we are looking now towards January of 2020 when we will return is we go out and depending, depending on what our interests are or the committees we serve on or chair, we go out into the interim to do site visits and get a chance to um, get out into our community and, and look at different issues and meet with different uh, groups and uh, individuals so that we can look at new solutions for 2020 in crafting bills, resolutions, um, anything like that. As far as bills goes, uh, I'll introduce 3,000 bills, give or take, right? Yeah. 220 tax, somewhere on 7%. Most of them, are, um, I, I don't want to keep saying die. They didn't die, they just moved to next year. Next year they died, yeah. right? They're still alive, <laughs> they just moved to next year. Um, if there's bills out there uh, that you are passionate about, either you want the governor to sign it into law or you want the governor to veto it, now's your time, right? Legislature did its work, there's 220 bills, they all walk up to the governor's desk, some have already become law with its signature, um, but most of them what's happening now is the governor is having his team, his budget and finance team, his attorney generals, their legal attorneys, looking at all these bills that the legislature produced, making sure it's constitutional, making sure it makes sense, making sure it matches what the governor's priorities are, and he'll decide whether or not he wants to sign it into law, or let it become law with its signature, or veto it. He has until, I believe it's like June 24th, to issue his intent to veto list. So that's when he has to publicly let the legislature know, hey, these are the bills that you guys sent me that I don't agree with, and I'm gonna veto. It then gives the legislature in a public time to contact the governor to say, hey, wait, maybe you don't want to veto this bill and this is why. Um, and sometimes that works. Sometimes he changes his mind, sometimes he doesn't. And then he has up until like early July to actually veto bills that he doesn't want to let become law. And so now is the time for you as a general public, um, if there's a bill that, that uh, uh, you know, is sitting on his desk, if you want to veto, now's the time to weigh in. And I mean, you can go to his website and you can express that. Want to add anything else? Oh, uh, no, yeah, okay. that's, that's just about wraps it up, I guess. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I think we have a lot of problems, right? We're about to go into the QA, too. So I just leave it right there. Um, but yeah, you know, I think what Kyle is saying is true. You know, at this point, it's really, up, it's not like a job description for this time of year. It's really what you make of it. So you know, what I've made an effort to do in the past is really, I tour every school, I do the administration, see what their needs are, that sort of thing. Um, and that's kind of unrelated to the committees we serve on. You know, Kai, Kai's a very busy guy, and he's gonna be, he's really made an effort, especially when he was in higher ed, he went to every single possible university employee system facility. You now with students, faculty, and administration, right? So uh, he's really taking the, the initiative on that, and we're gonna have a real opportunity over the next, I guess seven to eight months 
to really dig in and do that. And now is the best time. You know, during the session, you contact the legislators about things that are pending. Um, you know, give them feedback or you know, state your concerns. But this time of year, it's really a captive audience um, because it's not like they can tell you, oh, well, I'm, I'm in meetings all day. <laughs> we're, we're out in the community, but there's, there's a lot of time. And that's what we're supposed to be doing right now, is really hearing from the community, hearing your concerns, so that going into January, we really have a better picture on what the priorities of the people of Hilo are. So now is really a good opportunity to go in. Yeah, for both of us, at least uh, I can't speak for Chris, um, although he's probably here more than I am. We're, we're back home now. You know, starting right after, our staff start the first day right after New Year's, and it really kicks off for us. Both of us serve on the Finance and Ways and Means Committee, and those budget hearings start immediately. And so we go into full blast mode on this first work day after New Year's, and we don't stop until we adjourn, which is like the first weekend in May. And so uh, it's, it's a lot of back and forth. You know, I, I oftentimes, Fly over on the first flight every morning and uh, fly home, you know, just in time to eat dinner with my kids. So, being back home and being able to take my kids to preschool in the morning and drop them off and wake up with them and cook them breakfast, I'm happy to be home. You know, and, uh, and we so we work uh, really hard in those four months to try and um, do our best for for Hilo and, and East Hawaii. For me personally, I know that um, coming back as the water land chair next year. As um, uh, politically divisive the water bill was, I want to get an opportunity to. I took my waterland committee during session to East Maui, so we could go right to Ground Zero or where the issue was, walk in the streams, um, talk to the community to really get an immediate sense of where this bill was and what we needed to do. But now that that's done, you know, I've committed through the interim. And we've already started, we're meeting May 29th with DLNR and, and the Attorney General's office to find a solution for these water leases at the end of the year. And so what I want to do is to go out to some of these communities that have these water leases. So I'm going to plan to go to um, Wood Valley, where the uh, Mr. Olson has his water tunnels, um, Bill and Lonnie Petrie at Kapapala Ranch, the Galimbas, Randy Cabral, we're going to Kauai to look at KIUC and the East Kauai Co-op, I really want to understand uh, these water diversions and, and how you find a balance between, you know, our constitutional mandated public trust resources um, and also that balance between how do we continue to have and promote farm to the table, have a sustainable um, uh, agricultural industry, how we create renewable energy. You know, one uh, water permittee is helpful. That right there in the Waikoloopa River has a hydroelectric plant that's been there about 100 plus years. Yeah, yeah Dave. Um, they are the best and shining example of one of the permit holders that got a three year holdover extension in 2016 and banged out their EIS and got it done and basically is sitting on uh, the execution of their long term lease. Now, health goes a little different because the water that comes to the Wailuku River goes into the hydroelectric plant and then immediately comes out of the plant and, and goes right back into the river. So it's an in-stream use. Um, unlike uh, the Kauai rivers that never go back into the stream of origin because they get diverted away. And so health goes is a little bit different. But uh, nobody complains about health goes here. Right? No one, no one. No one, because I'll go, you know, prove that you can do an EIS, you can work with DLR and develop a watershed management plan, and you can do everything you can do within your power to get a long term lease. Now it's time for DLR to properly value that water and properly um, uh, decide how they want to structure that long term lease. Uh, one of the things we're doing is looking at uh, HRS 17158 to determine how you execute the public auction process um, to issue a long-term water lease. So those are some challenges. That's what I'm going to be um, delving myself into this year, as well as UH Hilo, ACC, Hilo Medical Center, and some of the critical needs in our community. But if you want to meet one-on-one, -on -one, or if you want to reach out to us, send us an email, and uh, we'll do our best to coordinate our efforts. Now is the time to do that. So, anything else?
Anything else you want to add? Uh, just, you know, to tag on to what Khan mentioned earlier about our schools and how old they are, you know, Kai takes credit, his past in terms of more than enough. Uh, he was able to help organize this meeting, probably at just about every school principal in East Hawaii there. And we went over, it just, the DOE just completed this very massive, um, what's, what's, how would you describe that? Uh, 21st like, century <laughs> schools? Yeah, like, like an inventory yeah. of all of the schools in the state and evaluated them based on uh, where they are, um, how many students versus what their capacity is, and age and quality of their facilities. And you know, when we talked to the guys who were responsible for conducting the inventory, uh, they basically shared with us, Hilo has the uh, most inadequate school facilities in the state. And a large part of that is just because I never went to a school that's less than 100 years old when I was here, until I went to UH Hilo. Is Hilo 100 years old? No, probably not. No, okay. uh, I didn't think so. So, you know, Kamala Elementary is 100 years old, you know, Green and Hilo High 100 years old. A building, which we mentioned earlier, Hilo Intermediate, this past year, when it was really hot, hit 105 degrees in the classrooms. But you can't put AC into building A because the electric is too outdated. And you can't, you can't put additional venting into the attic area because it's structurally unsound. And you can't plug in additional fans because of the electrical. So there's literally, they pretty much run out of solutions. Um, so, okay, we need to renovate building A. How much is it gonna cost? $70 million. And that's because it's a historic building, it's massive. It would probably be about the same price if we were to just destroy it and rebuild. Um, so that's the kind of decisions we're gonna be having to make over the next probably 10 years in Hilo, is what do we do with these aging schools or preserving some of that historic uh, nature of our schools, but also allowing for increased capacity they're projecting the next five years for most of our Waikia um, school complex that uh, they're going to have about a 30% increase in enrollment. Uh, right now, the only two schools that are not projected to be over capacity in East Hawaii are Waikia High School and Kapilani Elementary. Everything else is going to be over capacity. Um, that's going to cost hundreds of millions of dollars to do this. Um, and that's something we're really going to have to push for, uh, not just this upcoming year, but really over a very long period of time, because it's not going to be over. Let the people magic. speak, please. <laughs> it's after 7 o'clock. Sure. Sure, go for it. Before all the water questions come in, um, <coughs> you, were, you were talking about CIP at the airport and at the harbor. And Kai, I want to ask, uh, the air cargo facility in particular that you mentioned, what does that look like? I mean, who's, who's participating and who's running it? What is it? The air cargo facility? Right. So that was a facility run during my dad's, admin, uh, dad's time under Governor Abercrombie. I believe it was a $15 million project and they um, uh, built the cargo facility and in there now is, if I'm not mistaken, completely full or if not almost full. You have Hawaiian Airlines, which is an anchor tenant in there. They have a new cargo operation. They invested a lot of money in um, redoing the facility because it didn't meet their needs. I know you have Aloha Cargo that's there. Uh, they're on the end. You have the Department of Agriculture that's there. Um, I believe Transair has a footprint there as well. So what they're doing is they're tearing down all the old cargo facilities on, by the old dealer for power. And requiring everyone to move over, which is why there's not much people on the old side anymore. FedEx has moved over, all the other side moved over. Well, I just want to make a comment, and this is to criticize the appropriation. <clears throat> there is a study that sits in the R&D department of the county. It's been there for 35 years. Um, it's called the Hilo Air Cargo Warehousing and Distribution Center project and it came out of starting about 1984 and uh, that's the year that the last plantation on the Big Island went down. Yeah. And uh, people were doing what you do only with great desperation. Running around trying to figure out what's going to be the next um, crop, industry, whatever, 
for East Hawaii in particular Hilo. And it was more than just um, it would be the agricultural town or the light industrial town. Um, it was, you know, what are the jobs going to be? What the, what's the pay going to be? Uh, our character is linked to this. And so we enlisted the um, economics department of UH Hilo. And we went and talked to um, the equivalent of Dr. Bonham at the university and um, economists at that time were employed by the What's Hawaii. your question, please? And first to wine. You would like to have a question? <clears throat> yeah, you can talk. The question is, don't you need isn't the best way to do diversified agriculture, which could be a, an industry for East Hawaii, unless you have a better one in mind, couldn't it be best helped by creating efficient cargo <coughs> distribution center with investment from the government? Because there's a chicken and egg problem. The people out there growing things want to be assured that there's going to be this distribution operation. And um, the study was created. Well, that's all right. Mm -hmm. it, had an, it had an irradiation center, it had a cold storage center. It, it was. You said the study, this report was at, it's at the county? It's sitting in the library. This, yeah, okay. The county of Hawaii. It'd be worth looking at. Okay. I don't you know bet. why they haven't done anything with it. It had a, a full storage, regular storage, irradiation, and it was uh, powered by um, uh, geothermal and the shipping industrial park was part of it. Uh -huh. One part of this. Okay. We'll take a look at it. You know what I will add is Representative Mark Nakashima. Um, has been working hard on, has secured about $12 million to do a basically multi-purpose, multi-processing manufacturing facility um, where the foreign trade zone building is. And so he's been working with HTBC, the Hawaii Technology Development Corporation, the DBED, and uh, uh, you know, that's a facility that they're going to be bringing online as well. Study had a much larger group. Sorry, people. No, no, no. Because yeah, we'll the there. airport and the harbor here are closer together than anywhere else in the state. So you would be gathering all the crops from all the other islands. Okay. Centralizing it here. So right now it's a little after 7:05. We are going to end this at 7:45 because we need to be out of the building by 8 and be mindful of um, you and Chilo. And so just to give you an idea, we have about uh, 40 minutes or so. Questions? Corey? Right. Can you do anything about the cut to developmental disabilities division? I have a daughter who is blind and has learning disabilities. She's an adult to the day program. In the evening, she has, and weekends, she has assistance. And they're telling me in six months, they're going to cut her budget in half. And she is not the only one. There's like strange stuff happening at developmental disabilities. Cut the budget in half? When you say for cut someone's budget in half? The hours for her, the who's, budget for her services will be cut in half in six months. Your daughter? Yes. And she is not the only one. It's across the board. They're doing crazy stuff. Um, you know, she's fine. She has learning disabilities. And she does not have an assistant. She can't go out from her apartment, etc. We'll look, in, we'll look into that. Um, so I, I know Corey, so I wrote her name down. But if you ask a question and I, I don't know your name, make sure you say it so I can put it down and make sure your contact info is on the sign up sheet. <coughs> we will package these up and make sure our staff helps us um, look into that, Corey. Yeah. Next. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, my concern is uh, for our students, because I'm a student at Hawaii Community College, and I'm the I'm the incoming vice president for the the um, student government. So I'm here representing the students 
Um, my concern is that where is our student fees going to, and why is our student fees going to pay for a state position <coughs> when the student fees are supposed to be used for reinvesting to our students that the next generation will empower them to get to their destiny. <coughs> the other thing is that safety concerns for our community college, because our community college is falling apart. And we don't have a sidewalk going up to the UH Hill. So the safety on the highway when they're walking, they're walking on the on the people's grass. So um, that's a big concern. The other concern is that we had nine attempts suicides in our school. Okay? And they come to my office because they come and see uncle. Uncle, I need your help. I don't kill myself. Okay? But they don't like to see the mental health person that's in the school. Why? Because they carry on title. So the thing is that we need to prevent our students from getting to this, this point of killing themselves on campus without the people in our campus knowing, which is our chancellor, which is our vice chancellor. Okay? So we need to hold these people that is up there accountable to the students. So we can be treated not like a commodity, but we are students. We're not money. We're students. And we've been treated like that. And the students right now, they're crying because even in Hawaii Hilo, they got the dormitory, they got ants, roaches, they got bed bugs inside there, and the students, they got, when they graduate, they got to get out the same day. But what about those students that cannot afford to place downtown to stay so they can eat? They got to get kicked out of their dormitory, and then where are they going to stay? So the thing is that this session coming in the fall, when we come to the legislature as a student government board, we really want to address that our heartbeat of hero, our community college is our heartbeat. Our kahale, we call kahale. If the door doesn't stay open and the window not open, how are we going to come in? That door got to be a revolving door so the students can come in and out. They can interact. They can get all the things that they need, the proper equipment, the tools to graduate. Not with a degree only but with a potential job and line up with the workforce. So if our community car is not working with our, with our community in lining them up for the job opportunity, our students, they will be gone. They will be, let, they will be going to the mainland. No, and we talk about, we talk about, oh, with the investment is in the next generation. We talk about, we talk about the local people staying home, having jobs here. But how do they stay here? If the University of Hawaii would not even give an opportunity for a non-traditional student, which is me, an honor student, 3.5, to come to UH Manoa, to come to a social worker program, but they're not going to offer me nothing. So now, USC, which is Southern California, giving me $40,000 for coming to this school. And I am getting ready to go to USC because UH Manoa, they're not going to do nothing for the locals that, that we want to stay here and want to engage in the community. Because my, 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 um, my major is social work. The social work is reaching the community. The community that we see out here today is hurting. Okay. And it's in the families. Thank you. Jim Albertini. Yeah. Well, I'm going to make a compliment, but I won't. I'll pass on that. <laughs> no, 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 I want the compliment. <laughs> you promised the compliment. I'm glad you didn't cave in. Alexander and Baldwin is the man for 62 minutes. Yeah. 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 Now the same, two seconds. We're under a major military expansion in this state, and you guys are asleep at the switch. The military already controls 25% of Oahu and 133,000 acres on this island in the Senate. And what they're doing now is expanding beyond their bases into our shorelines, near coastal waters, even our parks, in special ops, assassination trainings. And the DLNR doesn't even know about this. And you guys haven't done anything to even have one public hearing on this military intrusion. They've drawn a big rectangle around the entire island of Oahu, and they said the entire island now is going to be subject to special ops. On this island, it's the whole South Koala coast. Mm -hmm. And they were going to do special ops in even Mauna Kea Park with armed troops right in the county park. We stopped that because of protests. Good. 
But that's something you've got to address. The thing I wanted to raise tonight is, I've talked to both of your offices, staff persons, sent emails in February, never had any response. And what I'm asking is this, and this is a historic night. Tomorrow there's going to be arguments before the Hawaii Supreme Court on the state's failure, what the judge said was to Malama Aina at Puakualoa, the 23,000 acres leased to the military. The state has failed to Malama Aina in that leased land. What I'm asking you is this, and what I asked your staff on February 20th. The University of Hawaii drilled a water well in June of 2013. It'll be six years next month. The test date of what's in that water has not been released. How come? Right. That's on state leased land. We want to know what toxins are in that water. Right. Things Ooh. like lead, things like perchlorate that also comes from rockets like the KL launch facility over there, my friend Kimo Lee. Mm -hmm. Like DFAS that's contaminating groundwater all over the country and the yeah, world. Right. Get the results for us. It's state leased land. It's six years. How long do we have to wait? Okay, so to answer your question, you contacted my office on the 20th of February. That's right. And you spoke to my University of Hawaii Hilo intern, Mark Jimenez, right here. You know, I never even called me back. I sent a follow-up email. So Mark uh, gave me the message, and we contacted Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard's office because she is our congressional representative. She initiated a letter, a question-answer letter, to Pohapaloa that we were waiting on as well. Today, I reached out to Pohapaloa's Lieutenant Colonel Horsey, the base commander, as well as his civilian um, counterpart, who is his deputy commander, Mr. Fleming. The deputy's right here, and Jeff Fleming. <clears throat> Mr. Uh, Fleming and Colonel Horsey said, you know what, we'll come down tonight and help you answer that question. I'm waiting. Yeah. So Mr. Fleming, do you have anything to add? Um, just directly to the question about the report that Jim is asking for, uh, we're looking for it as well. We have a contract issue with uh, RCUH University, or Research Corporation University of Hawaii, and Dr. Don Thomas is doing the work. Once that's resolved, we'll allow him to move forward and complete his work and characterization on that aquifer that we identified to include the water chemistry, the report that you're looking for, Jim. And uh, right now, he was doing exploration up to this point, drilling down and looking at the geology of the soils underneath the, uh, the saddle region area. He had two, two wells, two test wells up there. Uh, he dug down, hit a perch aquifer about 700 feet below the surface, and, and we explained that to Jim. It was about 500 feet thick. He knew that that was not what he was looking for. Continued to drill down. He did find water at 1,800 feet below the surface. And he continued to drill down to his permitted uh, depth, which was well over uh, 5,000 feet below the surface. And between 1,800 feet and over 5,000 feet, it's a fully saturated zone of water. It's the regional aquifer that he hypothesized or he thought might be up there. So we're convinced there's water there. Uh, and the area of extent of it is about uh, 100 uh, kilometers square, so 10 by 10 kilometers, 100 kilometers square. Uh, and you know, that's the next step is to continue that and get the water characterization study. And we're very interested in that. We want to see what it is. Initial report was that when he had pulled the water out of the lower aquifer, the regional aquifer, was that he did not see any subsurface contamination at all. So there's no evidence of that. But we want a more detailed water analysis done. So as soon as we get that, I know Colonel Borsi's talked about what he's going to do with that report. We made mention of it last night at the Kona uh, meeting that we had. Uh, and uh, he talked about <coughs> figuring out a way to share that or somehow provide that to the local public. So, and you so know, sir, like why would you continue doing live fire training without having those test results? Absolutely. Hold on. I wanted to thank Mr. Fleming for coming. Because he didn't have to come tonight, and I uh, wanted to thank Lieutenant Colonel Horsley for sending in. Because, you know, uh, Representative Todd and I are not subject matter experts on Pohakaloa and its operations there. You need to understand that Pohakaloa has multiple land uh, jurisdictions, right? You have um, 100.
160,000 acres? 133,000 acres, about 210 square miles. Right. Uh, we have different land ownership types. The one with the water well, that's on Army owned land. Not legally, this is the Kingdom of Hawaii. Right. So you have the federal uh, government through executive order um, as land. The territory of Hawaii, uh, or maybe it was the state of Hawaii, executive order land. You have land that Pohakalo purchased in the Waikiki area, 24,000 acres. Correct. And then you also have um, the DLNR managed state uh, public lands lease that they um, leased to Pohakalo in about 1964. That lease expires in 2029. Correct. And so there's, in essence, four different you know land jurisdictions around the entire Pohakalo area. So. I just wanted to thank you for coming because you didn't have to come. You worked up full day as well to come and help us answer this question. That's and where the, the wells drilled. And Kai, you were up there on Palm Sunday as one of the champions of Hawkaloa. And four days later, hundreds of school kids were taken into that area. And that base is contaminated with depleted uranium and a whole range of military toxins. You should be up there to say, don't bring the school kids in until there's comprehensive testing and monitoring to determine the, the danger to those school children. You're no. part of the whole military industrial complex, bringing in the F-22 Raptors, having school kids come to them. We went down there in a protest and we, we were threatened with arrest. You should have been there to protect our right to protest when you bring in those planes for public tours. You weren't there to stand up for us, right? The descent to those false gods of metal. You know, one point two billion dollars. My dad uh, worked at Guacamole for thirty-four years, and uh, he spent much of his entire life there, serving our country in a federal civil service capacity. And I'm very proud of his work. And you know, we in uh, in the past have not had local um, base commanders at Guacamole, but we do now. Um, Lieutenant uh, Colonel Ed Teixeira was one that served the base in the uh, 1980s. In the early 90s. Now we have Lieutenant Colonel Borsi, and I see a new opportunity under his leadership to um, open up the community to Pohakuloa through those types of community events that I completely support. I'm also an 18 year um, combat veteran in the Hawaii Air National Guard. And I'm, I'm a proud soldier, I'm a proud American, I'm a proud Native Hawaiian. And that's that. Next question. Hi. Um Relating to the expansion of the harbor and the new cargo facility, were any studies run about traffic for Keokaha, um, noise pollution? I know like Aloha Airline <coughs> Cargo are still using engine or something like that, engines that make a lot of noise still yet. Um, and then bringing more air traffic into Keokaha with only one way in or out. How are you? How how are you protecting those residents out of the So we'll say that the harbor, the harbor is kind of more of a long-term plan. It's expanding in a way. It shouldn't necessarily bring more traffic you know, in the short run, but it is something we have to address. And right? so I, I worked, I worked mm -hmm. Suicide Fish Market, White People Products. I worked in Kilauea for quite a while, right? And the traffic's really bad, especially with a lot of construction. That's and, super bad. Now. Yeah, it's really bad. You so White People Products are very really hard, right? Yeah. You pretty much, you kind of turn around, right. so you got to turn right in and all that stuff. Yeah, so, right now we get back yeah. up to like one from yeah. the stoplight. Do, do you know that, is that comedy or state? Yeah. Um, That's a comedy rule. So it, it is part of the long term planning, but something we have to do with, we, we definitely need some sort of road expansion, <coughs> even just accounting for the current traffic flow. Um, but with the cargo expansion, right now the biggest concern, and if you talk to Senator in Hawaii about it, she talks to me all the time about this. If you're exiting the airport road right now, there's no right turn lane. Mm -hmm. So you get jammed up. When it's busy, you get a 50, 60 car line over there. And same thing, not only for locals, you know, we fly all the time for work and stuff like that. But on top of that, if this is your touchdown in the whole into Eagle for the first time, you're probably stuck in traffic trying to exit the airport. Or you're trying to hail an Uber or something, or walking from the harbor right now. So it's going to be kind of a comprehensive plan between the state and county government, um, but I can't speak to the exact plans right now just because I don't have them on the top of my head. But I do know that it's being addressed. Um, we have to talk. I think we can talk to Sue in particular on the capacity issues in Kilauea. No, Kilauea is um, 
you know, it, like you said, it's one way in, one way out, right? And, and we have a school there, we have a whole community there, you have uh, tsunami evacuation zones. I mean, there's a lot of things that uh, come into play. But we'll, we'll definitely look up if uh, DOT Harbors did a um, traffic study and, and, and what they uh, envisioned for, for that area. I know most of it is public uh, lands down by Baker's Beach, all of those homes there, they all have revocable year year permits. And as the harbor continues to expand, you know, addressing that's very important. What we'll follow up, sir? Aloha. I'm not picking you around, I'm just, just, yeah. My, Aloha. My name is Alvin Wise. I currently live in Kaloli Ke'ao, but born and raised in Keokaha. More specifically, the shoreline, King's Landing shoreline at Waikahalulu Bay. We are here tonight, my daughter, niece, and nephew, because we are deeply concerned about the proposed uh, launch site, the aerospace launch site on the Puna coastline. So they have some questions for you. Sure. I'm so glad we have Kimo here representing shipping and state and uh, <laughs> <laughs> Kimo leaves in the house. So they can help with that. Yeah, go for it. Aloha, I'm Senator Kahele. I am Mark Lala Rosa. I'm a, I am a native Hawaiian who resides in Panaewa, Hawaii, on Aina Ho'opula Pula Pula. On Aina Ho'opula Pula, the age of town. I'm a junior at Kamehameha Schools who has an interest in studying law in college. I will also be voting in the 2020 election. I am very excited to cast my vote for a congressman who shares similar values and beliefs as I do. If you are elected, you will be the person who writes laws and represents me as a kanaka for the next two years. I am excited to have a kanaka from Boko Okeave to represent us. My kaiki kalo ika oha. The kalo is as strong as its root. Our roots are on Moko Okeave. I believe that as a kanaka, you would have the best interest for us, your people. Specifically kanaka from Boko Okeave near Na'au. My question to you is very specific, and it is regarding the SB 999. When sponsoring the bill, did you know that the proposed site was three miles away from our homestead community? Now that you do know, do you still support such a bill? One more question I have is, do you know of any other proposed bills regarding aerospace in the upcoming legislative session? So thank you so much for your question, and thank you for um making your decision that you're going to participate in our elections in 2020. I think it's great. I'll let you know it's, uh, if the governor signs a bill into law, you won't be able to cast your ballot on election day because it'll be mail-in voting. That's something that the legislature did pass. 100% mail-in voting across the entire state of Hawaii if he signs it into law. You will not walk in on election day and cast a ballot at White Bay High School. Everything's going to be mail-in ballot, so you got to make sure your address is correct and on file. I'm not here to talk about that other race. I appreciate your manao, but I'm here in my capacity as a state senator and as a state legislator. As far as your specific question goes, um, you know, the proposed launch site um, is on private land, in shipment land. My kids go to Punana, though, right down the road. When the um, Alaskan company came to talk to me about their proposal, I was very straight up with them. And I think the Tribune Herald captured my comments. I said, you know, uh, space launch facilities um, and different ideas like that have come to this island for the last 40 years. We all remember Kabul Spaceport, and uh, it never has come to fruition. And I looked them straight in the face, and I said, you cannot do something in East Hawaii until you do a couple things. You go to Kilkaf, you have a community meeting. Go to Hawaiian Paradise Park, you have a community meeting. Go to East Hawaii and have a community meeting. And you hear from Panaeva and Keao. You have a community meeting at Keao, the cafeteria at Keao High School. I told them to do that. And you hear from the community first, and you decide whether or not this is right for East Hawaii. And I think they did. And I think they went out to the community and they heard um, the <coughs> stiff opposition to that project. And so, as far as where the project is now, I don't know, Kimo, can you weigh in on what their proposed plans are? Yeah, they're going through the EA, EA process, so that's a time where you guys can put your comments and opinions. <clears throat> I also advise them to seek out the uh, cultural practitioners of that area. I specifically said they should go to the Kanakaole Foundation to go and talk to um, those um, that foundation and the individuals that represent that foundation 
as um, ones that would have probably the best subject matter knowledge area of that of that area of that Vatupana. So they would know if they knew where archaeological sites existed, caves existed in that in that Puna region. And so I don't know if they took my advice or not, but um, I would really really find it hard to imagine that a um, space launch facility will be built in East Hawaii from Puna all the way to Kau down to South Point. I, so, sorry, so, um, my second question was, is there another bill that you know of in legislative session that will regards the aerospace or anything that has to do with it? Uh, just so, so there's a lot of confusion around the proposed satellite launch facility uh, in terms of how, how it got to this point in the first place, right? The SB 999 that you're referring to is almost completely unrelated. Um, and that's more administrative to do with the state and it has to do with how it restructuring state government. The satellite launch facility money was actually appropriated in 2016. I think Senator Kahele had been in office for like six weeks. Um, I wasn't even in office yet. And it wasn't through a bill, it was actually just inserted directly into the budget. Uh, so basically what happened was there's money, there's money in the state budget that would uh, basically match funds to Alaska Aerospace Corporation for the environmental assessment. Alaska Aerospace Corporation is a state corporation, it is not a private company run by the government of Alaska. That's the legislature's only rule prior to this, and that was in 2016, but not in a bill. It was inserted directly into the budget. Um, so that's something that, I mean, if I'm being completely honest, the Tribune Herald article comes out, I had never even heard of it, because I wasn't even around when it got appropriated, and nothing had happened at the state level prior to that article even coming out. Um, just, just, just for perspective on the actual bill itself. There are tons of aerospace bills that come out. Uh, most of them have to do with this kind of stuff. It's just restructuring, like establishing an aerospace office within the state, as an example. That's pretty much what SB 999 Yes, is SB 999 was, had nothing to do with the, uh, the KAO proposed shipment estate Alaska Aerospace Project. It was to restructure the Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism and to create a Hawaii office of aerospace development. Um, and so that bill that I did sign on as, uh, I didn't offer the bill, but I did sign on to it. Um, never even made it out of the Senate. It looks like it didn't even make it out of this first committee. Do I know of other bills? No. I'm not introducing any bills. I don't know of any other bills. Um, like I said, any bill to include this bill is still alive. Um, it can be picked up next legislative session. Um, um, I understand um, that you sponsored the bill, so I want to know where you stand on it and what your support is to for this bill? Yes. No. Oh. I mean, I'd be willing to get the bill, give up, to get, uh, give the bill a public hearing. I mean, I'm, I'd like, I'm open to all ideas and give the, chance, uh, the public a chance to testify. This bill was never given a hearing. Um, so yeah, I mean, I have no problem having given the bill here. Okay. Yeah. Hi, Um, as a full supporter of Pahakula, and I assume the military, militarism of our islands, which make us the largest base, military base on the planet. And as a proud American and as a proud Native Hawaiian, I'm very curious to know what are your thoughts about the current developments with the United States relationship with Iran and also with Venezuela. I don't think that, I can talk to you offline about that, that doesn't relate to this. Um, this, but it's uh, like the military being a, such a big part of Hawaii and our economy. I'm and sure the there are other questions that relate to this legislative session. Thank avoiding you. the topic. Yes, I have a question regarding Senate Bill 78. I believe the governor um, he was appropriated $1.3 million for preschools. Do you know if Hawaii Island will be receiving funds to expand a preschools on our island or in East Hawaii? Uh, yes. So our island is already the biggest recipient of the early childhood education funding. We have more of these preschools. I think we might just have more outright um, than the rest of the state, but we definitely have more per capita. Um, part of it is just that we have facilities that can accommodate this sort of thing. Um, so the big debate this year at the state capital was how it's structured. Uh, so 
when this was originally, uh, when it originally came online, this executive office on early childhood education, um, it sits within the governor's office. But by law, it cannot stay there. So right now, it's kind of a turf war between the DOE and the actual office of early childhood education. And I don't think it's been completely settled, um, if I'm being honest. Part of the concern is you have school principals who want to want this to be seated within the DOE so that they still have that kind of authority over their own school, which is understandable. You want to control, if you're going to have a preschool on your campus, you want to have that pre-K all the way through, you know, fifth grade or sixth grade, depending on the school you're at. Um, but from the um, Office of Early, Early Childhood Education's perspective, they are the subject matter experts because the DOE has not traditionally provided a lot of these services. So it's kind of where we're at right now. But the Big Island will be a substantial recipient of the expansion. And if it continues with the actual plans that are currently on the books, the five-year expansion, this is going to be a dramatic expansion. It's very ambitious. Um, we're talking about um, orders of magnitude, exponential growth for early childhood education, um, both on the Big Island and statewide. Uh, but like everything, it's going to cost Ridiculous amounts of money. Yeah. Uh, Six hundred thousand dollars per classroom just to get it established. Senate Bill seventy eight. Were, were you specific to uh, early learning center here yeah, in East Hawaii or <coughs> I know the this island? No, it's one point three. It's both way. No, I know. But your question was for are yeah, we doing? Okay. Okay. We can find out. Okay, thank you. I need, I need to get your email though before before you leave. But we'll, we'll ask for sure. This guy Kamahina had a question that she didn't. Aloha, Senator Kahane. I am Olivi Wise. My question will be focused around this Ola Lono Eo. Helala Awe Kuukumu. I'm a branch of my tree. I live in Puna. My dad's bay is Paki, and my mom's bay is Waikalu. Both bays are my playground after school. It is both places where I learned to go. It is at both places where I learned to go holo holo. We are alike in many ways. You love the kite, I love the kite. You're Kanaka, I'm Kanaka. Your dad loved the kite, and my dad loved the kite. We are alike. As you know, Alaska Aerospace would like to build a rocket launch near both of my school's playground and base. The Elha is unbelievable. I'm interested to learn how you as Kanaka Mali from Milali'i, who grew up learning and growing on a, on I know, and in the car like mine, would feel if a rocket if a rocket launch built on your school and playground. My question to you is, do you support the building of the launch pad on our Puna coastline? No. Thank you. Hello.
We have a lot of advocates for the university, but who speaks for the community college? Okay, so just, just same thing, just for more for background purposes. The university is, and the system is somewhat a uh, Most of the CIP that you see that gets appropriated comes directly through university system requests. So if the community college is not getting their fair share, it's usually a system decision. We can put in requests for additional funding, whether it's aeronautics, whether it's specific requests for the pharmacy school, um, or new dormitories, or the Hawaiian college, all those things. But the actual base request comes through the university system. Um, but I agree. And so historically, part of the problem is that there wasn't a clear path as to the future of the community college. There was a lot of debate on whether they're going to use the existing footprint or potentially expand into the back where the Department of Transportation is for additional acreage, or whether to build an entirely new college site on Hawaii. That's that what was intent was. That was very recent. And, and that's my point. So, it always seemed that the community college is it was in flux. <coughs> and, 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 and I feel that there's a lot of good career paths for our local kids at the community college level. Right. You know, a lot of kids go to the mainland, but they don't cut it. No, and, and I agree. And so, yeah, I coach football at Ohio. Most of my kids, if they're going to college, they're not going to be playing football at USC. Most of them are going to end up at the community college level. And then that's going to take them either to a career path or to a four-year four year university. Yeah, and so another that's thing that, that, that I, I kept running into <coughs> the teachers, instructors, and people that know the system say they're going to be in college and you know, they don't get along. And that married Yeah, it, it's shocking that, that, you know, it's the same funding and the same kids, and yet they don't work together. Yeah. I don't understand that. So we are, we are very hopeful. We have a brand new chancellor coming in this summer. That's something we're going to have to really build uh, into that relationship. That it, it should go hand in hand. And, you know, we're, we're taking an effort at the state legislature. We have the, um, we have the promise program that just went instantly, just got instituted. And that's just at the community college level. If you're a Pell Grant recipient or Pell Grant eligible and you have unmet financial need, the state legislature will currently cover 100% of your financial need at the community college level. Um, and so that's the initial step. The next step forward is bridging the gap between that program and the four-year university. So one of the bills that almost passed this year, unfortunately did not, is if you're one of the recipients of the Promise Program at the community college level, and you were then going to move on to the university, whether it's Uichilo, Manoa, Westerwald, or wherever, then you can continue to receive that funding. Because we don't want people to come to the community college and then feel like, now that I'm at this level of education, I cannot continue my education. And by, that, by then, you've already proven that you have what it takes to get you um, and just same thing, to like, take like five seconds since we're running out of time. If you're concerned about the University Promise Program, it is automatically put towards tuition. It is not something you have to apply for. So it's already taken into account as part of the And last year's budget, um, ACC got $2 million for plans and design to focus on the, the campus here to go vertical. So they've abandoned the ELP Pomona campus. There are some of the report to see what has come out of that. So I know you have five minutes, but I want to thank you, um, President Todd, for the ROB bill that you helped, um, you supported, and pushed through, and everything. But I have a question. I wonder if that's enough. You know, we're really at a time in, in Hilo where the, you know, we see it, we're at a time of transition when we have to make choices about what kind of community we want to be, you know, in, in the future. So I'm wondering if that's enough, especially when I go right. along Saddle Road and you see um, new subdivisions proposed where there are Ohio forests. If we're going to continue to, for instance, allow the clear cutting of acreage, you know, for years I've been here and you see people they go in and they buy an acre at Hawaii Paradise Park or for acres and they completely wipe out the Ohia and so replace it with ponds. You're, you're so right. You know, the, original you're bill, the original request by the was actually $2 million. 750000 is what we were able to secure, but it's not enough. $2 million isn't enough. Um, it's an existential crisis. And we don't have a solution, we just have band-aids right now. We need a lot more. You're right. I have a question. And I've been waving my hand from the very beginning. And I feel, and I'm, I'm saying this directly to you, Senator Kahele, because I came to a meeting early on. We sat through your presentation just like now. 
we were in a place, same place, here at the school, and we're grateful. But you said, after we listened to you, and the other two members, another senator who has passed, and a house member, and then you said, your wife's birthday was that night. And you had to leave to go to fix her dinner. After we sat and listened to you folks, you don't have the chance to listen to us who vote you in. It is us who put you there, and we are the people you serve. So that was very offensive to me. And what I have to say, and I know we're at five minutes, and the minutes were counting, and my heart told me, you don't want to hear me speak. And it's very important to me because I am concerned about this water source that everyone's talked about for Hakuro. I know in 1996, there was a write-up in the newspaper where they drilled from the top. They were shocked to find that they hit the water source at such a high level, and it was pristine water at the top. So the question to me is, have you folks checked on the top? Because we've been waiting so long for what the reading is from the bottom. That's my question. Have you folks checked? Because if you haven't, then check the record of whoever's drilled from the top. In 1996, I read it in the newspaper. And that is what my question is, because that's where you folks need to check now. There's nothing that's being told about, about the bottom. So tell us what's up there on the top before it hits the bottom, because they're going to drill to accommodate that 180-foot observatory. And that deferral and deferral, and they're going to go to Canary Islands, and they're still here, and they're going to grow and start to dig. Did. That's my question to you. Protect the pristine water that's at the top. Don't let it get to be poisoning going upward. That's what I put before you as a question. What are you folks doing about the top? So I have personally uh, challenged every one of the observatories on Mauna Kea uh, to include at the Halekohaka site to immediately convert to a zero discharge wastewater system. Not the discharge. Give us a reading of the reading from the top. The water, the water source at the, begins at the top. No, sure, we can do that. I'm just saying you asked a question, and I'm telling you that I have well, addressed the observatory. You have no reading from the top. Is that what you're saying? I, I have no reading at the top. Okay. We can that's look that's that. my question. Sure. Yeah, we'll look because into that. that's what I would love for you folks to check. Sure. So I can start with the Institute for Astronomy and Mauna Kea, Office of Mauna Kea Management, because that's who manages the summit of Mauna Kea. Well, if you're, I, this is what I'm putting before you. Will you please check sure. the top? Sure. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. A few more minutes. Who has not asked the question? Hello, my name is Please Hello. Marty, my son, but don't because we're here because of their generation. Um, I am Grace Christina Mamoli playing Mozilla, and thank you for all of your time getting up every day to come and face the public and for what you are doing. Um, all of the issues that are brought up today affect me, and I'm a lot of anxiety right now compared to when I walked in. And so thank you to everyone for coming and bringing up your questions because everything brought up applies to me personally. So I live in Kyokaha, and there's not one school, but there's four schools, and if you want to count preschools differently, there's five. There's Kapa Elementary, there's Kiala Ahana, there's Kamehameha Preschools, there's Kaumiki Kaeo that's still at EKF, and there's their preschool. So that's in Kyokaha, along with all the residents that live in Kyokaha, both of DJL and everyone that goes down to the ocean as well. Now, I'm also a driver of Uber and Lyft, so I do see the airport and I see the harbor every day. And so I see that. And I see that's a problem. And I talk to all the visitors all the time. And I'm like, I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry. You know? So there's that. 
<laughs> what I also see is that there's a total of $77.7 million that has been allocated to the airport and to the harbor this year. And there's 140,000 dedicated to Kilpa Elementary, which is great, but it's 0.18% of what was allocated to this area that, you know, outside of it, 0.18 is going to what's inside of it that's breeding keiki and our future kanaka. Not to even talk about outside of Kilpa. That's 0.18%. And then, you know, my mom, she is born in 1948 and she's deaf and she has to buy her own hearing aids. My sister is born in 1982, and I have to talk to her a million times because she can't hear me. This is my son. He lives at 222 Avenue. I don't want him to have to have hearing aids. I don't care about me. I care about him and his children. And she just said that funding for disabled services just got cut in half across the board. So that affects me again. And the water popular, well, you know, it's got to come down to Guayaquil and to Kyokawa. And so with that note and with this keiki, I have another question that above all this and money matters more to me. With water scarcity happening around the globe, especially in third world countries, and the ever increasing demands for water in major industrial sectors in all societies, will the state of Hawaii create legislature that protects drinking water for its citizens, or will industry find a way to coerce our government into the sale of our drinking water, our water, which in turn might leave our children in the state of water scarcity without such perfect protections. To me, more important than $77.7 million is Vai, because Vai to our Kanaka is Vai Vai, and it's always going to be more important. So if we can find a way to protect our Vai, then I think that everything else, everything else matters way less than protecting our Vai. So I would like to ask to please find a way to protect that, and if I can help at all, please let me know. I have a network of people all over the world because I drive for Uber Lyft, and I live in Kilpa. So, you saw on the paper the proposed water bottling facility is dead dead. So that's something we're all happy about. Um, almost, almost everyone. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, I, I can say, you know, everyone's here. Any proposed water bottling facility on our island, I will. Something that we should work on. This is something that didn't get talked about a lot, you know, when I was growing up. And something we're kind of coming to mostly because we have a lot of companies that are actively exploiting uh, areas of the world like Nestle and Coca Cola and all that. And so it's something we need to address, and you're right, it's something we need to preserve now. I don't think a lot of people understand that the water cycle doesn't just keep spinning like that. It takes a very, very long time, and there are limitations to it. We will run out of water one day um, if we don't really take action now. So, um, beyond that, we did have a bill this year, HP 425, which deals specifically with water quality monitoring for our shoreline. Um, it's again, it's sitting there, it's not technically dead, but it did not pass this year. Uh, right now, the Big Island only has one water quality monitor for the entire island, it works with the Department of Health, um, which is the same pretty much for every other island. But our island's a lot bigger and it's got a lot more water. Um, so I think it's something we need to move forward. Right now, it's just a matter of funding priorities. And we, we got it through, it's just waiting on that last approval, and we're going to take another crack at it next year. Um, we're particularly concerned in Kilka, obviously there's a lot of attention around that, but because that's such an essential part of that community, and because we have people who come there from other communities and really enjoy being there, and because there's a lot of industrial facilities, that's something we need to address. And, uh, as, you know, as you all know, Terry Nampi guys did a great work on that, bringing attention to it. Um, so that, you know, part of the concerning thing is in the wake of Hurricane Lane, we had this brown water advisory for East Hawaii that was along the runoff. But we also had millions of gallons of sewage directly leaked, um, just untreated, and the county did not post any signage. And when we talked to the county, they said they didn't need to post signage because the state had already designated a brown water advisory. No. But who, how, so beyond our residents who may not be aware that there's a brown water advisory and who are paddling the next day, right? If, you're, if you've come here and you want to enjoy one of our beaches, how could you possibly know that the Department of Health has issued a groundwater advisory because there's no signage? Um, so that's something, it's a larger structural problem we need to address through HB 425 and more active water quality monitoring. But in addition to that, we do need something on the books protecting us from uh, you know, 
kind of for-profit entities trying to take some of that and bottle it and send it somewhere else. And government and military as well. We have time for one last question. Is there anybody who hasn't asked a question yet? There we go. I'm concerned about the reef trafficking bill. Um, there's a lot of fish being poached off, off of the reef mm -hmm. and uh, sold at very high prices on the mainland. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're treated cruelly, their fins are cut, they're starved, and most of them don't even make it to the mainland. Why did that bill fail? Reef trafficking. Tra tra the aquarium fishing canes. Those are your bill. Oh, so yeah. So that bill. Never made it through the House of Representatives. So the bill made it to the Senate, um, went to the House, never got it. So, what are we going to do to make it happen next year? I think we need more pressure. Tell me about it. It actually died in my committee and never got it. Uh, so, that's something you can, you can address correspondence to our committee directly um, and get as much testimony as possible, but I think that's a matter of pressure. If I'm, if I'm being honest. It's something that I supported, it's something he authored, and we weren't able to get it through this year. But there's nothing that's going to trigger in the next year that's going to make it happen. It's going to take more pressure and more pressure. We're, we're really close on passing the shark and ray bill. And that, you know, that, uh, they took the sharks out at the last moment. <laughs> Not blaming anybody, but it's, yeah, it's unfortunate. There were some good bills that. Um, some we've never passed, some we, we took, you know, half of it rather than the whole thing. And as far as the aquarium bill goes, I mean, it's still alive and it's sitting in the house right now. And the house literally can, when we come back into session next year, pick that bill up. That's where the part of the pressure. Yeah. Me, uh, <laughs> hey, you know, we want to thank you all for coming. And we really, really appreciate your time and effort for sticking with us the whole time. Um, thank you, Mr. Clark. Chris and I are, are here back when we need them, and so it's a good chance uh, to the interim to get a chance to answer some of your questions. If you had something specific, and um, if Mark here doesn't have your email address, make sure we do, and um, we'll do our best to answer some of those questions and respond to you through email. And with that being said, thank you so much for coming. Have a great night, and mahalo.